This is a BBC Radio 4 archive edition of Alistair Cook's Letter from America. Good morning. A listener in South Africa likes the idea of starting this talk with a quiz. He was staggered a week or two ago to hear a recital of famous American names he'd never heard, and he thinks I ought to do it more often. Well, at the risk of turning the letter into that well-known quiz program from New York, I might try it once more by way of a come-on, or cow-catcher, as they used to call the metal frame attached to the front of a locomotive. Well then, what do these three things suggest in common? A knock on the door, a flash of lightning, and pumpkin pie. Put it a more teasing way. Every Sunday morning, there's a ritual in our house, as in millions of others, which is to break open the 350-page package of the Sunday paper, search through it, find the weekly television supplement, and then, starting at A, going through 10 pages to Z or Z, to get a general idea of the films available to us during the coming week on the 75 channels that we can presently choose from. This week, there were, from ABBA, a Swedish film, to Zorba the Greek, 449 movies. That's normal. What was not normal, if you started to surf the channels, was the interminable flashing succession of death's heads, lightning-struck castles, moaning hounds, blood-stained talons, and a whole bunch of actors, Frederick March, Michael Caine, Peter Cushing, Lon Chaney, Jack Palance, growing alarming tumors on their cheeks and foreheads, and shaggy hair on the backs of their hands. To put it bluntly and incredibly, there were available between Sunday morning and Thursday midnight a choice of 82 horror movies. Friday morning, all was calm and bright, and with the rising of the sun, no more, of course, vampires. The children knocking on the door, the flash of lightning, the more inviting thought of pumpkin pie are all symbols of Halloween. Not until I first came to this country did I realize what an all-embracing, all-terrifying festival it could be. I don't remember its being a big deal in England. But the other day I called a Scottish friend because Scotland was the place where its rituals and superstitions held on longest, and perhaps still do. And he told me that, as for England, when he lived in London a few years ago, next door to an American family, and when, on the evening of October the 31st, he heard a knock on the door, opened it, saw two little children saying, trick or treat, he hadn't the slightest idea what they were about. I take it then that the whole of Britain on the last day of October does not give itself over to dressing up in grotesque or comical masks. A knock at one door this week revealed a momentarily frightening image, a miniature ashen-faced Bob Dole. It was not, of course, it was a little rascal from apartment 10B. We usually, on Halloween night, or All Hallows' Eve, leave outside the front door a little bowl of candy, knowing by now that if you go and say brutally that you have no treat, no tot is going to perform a trick. They seem to have learned down the years that they're going to get the candy anyway. I wonder when the decline set in with the very elaborate celebrations on the last night of October. It was not only the Eve of All Saints' Day, Throughout Celtic and Anglo-Saxon times, it marked also the end of the summer and the eve of the new year. It was the big time of the year for returning herds from pasture, and the day on which laws, especially of land tenure, property rights and so on, were renewed. 
And because November had come to be thought of in what are facetiously called temperate countries as a bleak season, no sun, no birds, no warmth, November, the last night of October took on all sorts of sinister meanings. It was a time when witches, hobgoblins, ghosts and demons roamed abroad. I think we shouldn't assume that the attendant rituals and superstitions, exorcising demons and so on, were the custom only among low, ignorant types. Throughout the 17th century, educated people held a strong belief in witches. Throughout the early 19th century, in ghosts. In fact, only 60 years ago, the BBC set up an experiment in a country house to prove or disprove the existence of a ghost which one of its own staff swore to. For centuries in the so-called civilized world, disease was attributed to your having offended the gods in one way or another, and it occurs to me that the witch's weird brew in Macbeth, boiled toad, eye of newt, toe of frog, and so on, was not at all weird in Elizabethan times. It was very much like the prescriptions any learned pharmacist would write out for you. Well, sorry, hadn't meant to go into our long-lasting stupidity about demons, ghosts, and vampires. How about vampires? They weren't, I discover, the invention of sensible Scots, who otherwise prescribed root of hemlock and gall of goat, not to mention haggis, for a bad case of the flu. The vampire legend seems to have grown up in Eastern Europe as a belief in the restless souls of dead men who leave their graves at night, suck the blood of the living, and beat it back to the coffin or the dust at daybreak. The later twist given to it in Mexico was to transfer the legend to the blood-eating bat, which does exist. Desmodus rotundus, it's called, which, however, is nothing like as large and fearsome as Bela Lugosi with his gown on. It is, in fact, only three inches long, has reddish-brown fur and sharp incisor teeth which pierce the skin of a sleeper and lap up his blood with the tongue without waking the man up. Not to worry, though. They're rare. The bite is not fatal. What you have to fear from many more species of bats, on Long Island, for instance, is the fact that they carry rabies. In Western Europe and the United States, the vampire legend didn't really take hold until the very end of the century, when Bram Stoker, Sir Henry Irving's business manager, wrote Dracula. And throughout this Halloween horror week, Dracula has reigned almost supreme. Rather, his supremacy is shared with the other great horror original, created 80 years before Bram Stoker by Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, who most famously played Frankenstein in the movies. Boris Karloff, wrong. Colin Clive, Karloff, was the Frankenstein monster. These two have ridden the airwaves, along with, as I say, dozens of variations, not to mention documentary profiles and biographies of Edgar Allan Poe, Conan Doyle, Stoker, Vincent Price, Wilkie Collins, help. I don't honestly know how many of the religious, legal, and medical rituals and superstitions ever got to this country, but from the late 19th century on it was Irish immigrants who gave a great fillip to the celebrations and shenanigans of Halloween as a secular festival, not least as yet another permissible occasion for hitting the bottle. Mark Twain noticed the Irish gift for inventing whiskey festivals and expressed his admiration for their ability to take it in a memorable passage. Give an Irishman lager for a month and he's a dead man. 
An Irishman is lined with copper, and the beer corrodes it. But whisky polishes the copper, and is the saving of him. Several cities in several states used to have huge all-day parades of clowns, cowboys, demons, Indians, and allow a small fry to paint their fancies on the windows of public buildings. These festivals have gone, I believe, with the wind and the telly. But what remains everywhere is the dedication of the evening to small children, to their dressing up in grotesque costumes, to going from house to house or apartment to apartment, to claim a trick or treat, and to go home to a supper which ought to end with pumpkin pie. Pumpkin is a more recent form of pumpkin, known and grown and cooked since the earliest colonial days. Pumpkin farmers do a roaring business in the weeks before Halloween. The fields adjoining our village were packed lately with roaming families, picking their own pumpkins and staggering off to the car with them. Apart from the pie, their special function on Halloween night is a hollowed-out pumpkin set up outside houses in windows, halls, shops, with eyes carved out, a leering mouth, a candle stuck inside, the whole representing a jack-o'-lantern, the figure, that is, of a night watchman. Well, Halloween provided, as you might guess, a very welcome escape from the presidential campaign, though it appears most minds had managed to turn off the election anyway. The conventional wisdom is that such is the general apathy or cynicism about politics and politicians that the smallest turnout in years is predicted next Tuesday. As for the campaign, Mr. Dole, having for two months made saintly efforts to be statesmanlike and affable, suddenly came to believe what many of his party chiefs quietly told him that he was positively going to lose. Mr. Dole turned angry and mean and resurrected the character that lost him the New Hampshire primary four years ago. We've been saying all along that only some shocking scandal could stop Mr. Clinton's re-election. Believe it or not, there have been shocking scandals of private life, of the scoundrelism of several of his aides, of flagrant violation of the campaign financing laws, of sexual misbehavior. Mr. Clinton's response is to have no response, to hear no evil, confess none, appear everywhere with a pink, smarmy, nodding smile, like a low-key Pompey returning in triumph to Rome. It means, I suppose, he has no doubt about the outcome. Nor do any of us, in spite of, was it Mr. Micawber's warning, that accidents can happen in the best regulated families. That was Letter from America with Alastair Cook. You can find more Letters from America and thousands of other programmes for curious minds on the Radio 4 website.